Welcome to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. With me today is Kevin Hart, founder and CEO of GreenCheck. Thank you very much for joining me today, Kevin. Uh, it's a pleasure, David. Big fan. Glad to be here today. Excellent. Well, before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. If you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You can also subscribe to our daily newsletter. Make sure you get it delivered to your inbox first. Uh, Kevin, if you're a fan, you know that I always like to start with a bit of background. Um, How did you get involved with the cannabis industry? Uh, it was a somewhat of a circuitous route. It wasn't a, it wasn't a direct route. I'll, I'll admit that. So my background is enterprise software, uh, global technology companies. I've taken companies public, exited a couple to publicly traded. I work with VCs and private equity folks for about 10 years. And, you know, um, I'm not, I'm not a big company person. I just kind of, I just don't fit well in a big company environment. They move too slow. I get frustrated um, because, um, uh, I've got a little bit of an OCD, uh, data, uh, personality head going on. And so, you know, securitously I was running, uh, I ran the largest independent Apple dealership in the world. It was a company called TechServe in New York city. And as part of that, uh, this is going back to 2010, 2000, no, 2012, 2013, um, I was responsible for uh, putting the iPads in the airports all over the U.S. Uh, past TSA. And that was a fascinating technical exercise. But the super cool thing was connecting people to data in new ways that they didn't know possible, especially at a consumer level in a restricted environment. And so I was approached to replicate that and do a similar model for the cannabis industry, point of sale, you know, this is it was in 13 states at that time, medical only uh, Harborside was the OG back then, especially. And so, you know, you have to work your way to security, through the silk lines, you get to the counter. What can I buy? And you're feeling time pressure. You don't know what's available. And so I was originally going to build a point of sale system for the cannabis industry. I've built global ones before. Uh, and then the more I found out about the the challenge of banking and access to financial services, um, I scrapped the whole concept of, you know, building a point of sale industry. I really started focusing on how do you connect these two independent, highly regulated industries that are dying to work together, that want to work together, but how are you going to make that possible? And as is the case with everything in life, it's data, data availability, data visibility, data in action. And so that became the genesis for Green Check and what we've become today. So what is Green Check and how does it make that connection between cannabis and banking? So we're a web-based app. It's a single platform. It's the same platform for everybody. And, you know, to date, we've uh, we have 154 different financial institutions that have signed agreements with us that want to serve the cannabis industry in some form or, or fashion. So these are banks and credit unions. And, you know, the starting point for everybody, of course, is depository relationships. But, you know, despite the historical reluctance of financial institutions serving the cannabis industry, they wanted to do it. Their their challenge was, how do I do it and stay compliant with the rules and regulations of banking, either at a state or a federal level? Uh, how do they know they're letting good money in and keeping the bad money out? I mean, you know, simply, simply put, that's the sum and substance of their primary challenge, aside from reputational risk and any of those other areas that we can delve off into. You know, how do they know they're not becoming money launderers? That's it. And so now on the cannabis side, you know, you have these evolving. So this is this is in 2015, 2016. And then knowing how the industry was projected to evolve, but we didn't know exactly how it was going to evolve. How do you look at the different states, the different license types, the different uh, market segments, the different modalities? How are you going to be able to collect that information and then connect it, but then analyze it to assure compliance so that the financial institutions know they're dealing with a good business and good dollars? And then, but how do you make it easy and scalable for the cannabis industry and actually do it at an effective price point? So when GreenCheck launched, 
there were there were financial institutions out there charging five six thousand dollars a month and then they were charging basis points on top of it um not sustainable it wasn't it wasn't a good business model then we never thought it was going to be a good business model on a go forward which is why we never charged the cannabis industry cannabis businesses to be on the platform so if you take half the financial equation out okay how do you then still drive it to an effective price point and we all know, and some of us know better, and some of us believe better. Okay, so I'll I'll be the zealot. Technology does what people can do faster and cheaper. In a lot of cases, not always better, but faster and cheaper. Okay, now if you can add the better component to it, now you have some somewhat of an answer. So again, it goes back to being able to connect them. So how do you analyze the health and well being and compliance of a cannabis business? And so that the financial institutions are comfortable serving them, but to be then be able to do that at scale. So it can't be bespoke work. It can't be project work. It can't be one off. And then everything has to sit and fit in with the core, which is the compliance, because the rules and regulations are going to change on both sides all the time. Mm -hmm. And so how do you make that the nucleus? So when we started back to my background in fixing uh, broken portfolio companies that suffer from founderitis. It's a real disease uh, for technology companies. I coined that phrase many years ago, and I continue to use it. Um, how do you how do you build a platform that's going to do that, that has differentiation, relevance, and sustainability? Those are the things that matter. And so we did not write a single line of code for two years. Design your company know what you're going to do, know why you're going to do it. How does differentiation, relevance, and most importantly, sustainability matter and play into that? Vet that out endlessly to the cohorts that are involved. And that's a wide circle. We'll spend time there if you'd like. Uh, but then be able to scale that and push it out. So what were those early hallmarks? What were those early touch points? What was the total addressable market? And you can build an effective company. It's not not that hard. You just have to be disciplined. What is founderitis? <sighs> so it has many. It has many uh, many things that like trigger it. Okay, great idea. You know, horrible marketing concept. You know, wonderful marketing, zero product. Okay, <laughs> so you know, hey, we we could do this. All right, show me how. Um, look over there. You know, we haven't built the product yet. And so it has it has many symptoms depending on the, the size, the life cycle, the stage of the company, the idea they're trying to apply, what their total addressable market, does it have a does it have financial viability? Is it sustainable? You know, that's a key hallmark for any of that. And so founderitis comes in many forms, uh, but it manifests itself in many, many different ways. And there's a list of people in the cannabis industry that suffered from or are in the throes of severe founderitis today. We won't name them. They raise their hands all the time. You know who they are. Have you ever had a conversation with a founder where you're just like, oh, no, I, I don't know if you knew this, but you're suffering from founderitis? Uh, yeah, actually, I have. I have. And, you know, so again, in that period of my professional life where um, after s selling a technology company uh, to a publicly traded company, uh, I decided I knew what I didn't want to do. And that was go run another technology company at that point in time. I was I was burnt out. I'll, I'll admit it. I'll raise my hand. And so working for VCs and private equity people, it would uh, I would go in and uh, look at some of their portfolio companies that were struggling from founderitis. Uh, but I had two absolute conditions of, of how I would do that work. One was I had to be able to fire board members, okay? Because a lot of companies, uh, founderitis is, is exacerbated or the symptom manifests itself because the board is giving them bad directions and something to do. The other, the other part, which was even more important for me personally, was I wasn't going to be Chainsaw Al. So Chainsaw Al Dunlop, you know, of of business fame, would go in and just slash the hell out of a company. You know, take all the expense out, and there we're fine, we're okay. Those are numbers. That's not the health and well being of a company. And by and large, I believe this, and I still believe this today, that the vast majority of people that work in a company 
they don't they don't go to the building or in our world today in the virtual reach for the door handle and say, well, I'm going to do a crappy job today. You know, I'm just going to coast. I'm going to do my best to make this company suffer. Most people are exceptionally well-intentioned and want to survive. It's the founders, the leaders or the investors that put them on the path to ruin a lot of times. And so um, I just wanted to make sure that I was focusing on helping the companies that wanted to be helped, that could be helped, and that the people who are hiring me weren't going to get in the way. I'm not the smartest guy in the room, okay? But I might be the oldest, and I may have gone through a lot on a global basis. And so founderitis presents itself in very, very meaningful, direct ways. It's amazing to me how valuable companies find these chainsaw owls and how they still are hired and the tactic still seems to pull the wool over people's eyes, even though it happens every a time and again. Yeah. And, and at bigger companies, I mean, you know, this we're, we're slightly off topic and, but this is your podcast at an associate. I mean, look at something like we were, okay. That was never going to work. Okay. Yeah. Never, never. It just the math didn't work. It wasn't sustainable. And yet, Oh, let's throw more money at it. Here you go. Let's go. Yeah, well, it, it's bizarre. Again, you don't have to be smart. You can stand on the sideline and go, this is horrible. One thing that you said earlier that intrigued me was that, uh, you know, you're the person to build the company, but not necessarily, you know, bring it to a certain point and then get out. When did you realize that that's where you were comfortable and happy? So I started as as a programmer in the late 70s, I was an assembler and then a COBOL program. I'm a real propeller head, but my propeller is old, bent, and rusty. And trust me, nobody on our engineering team wants me anywhere near code, okay? They won't even show it to me, uh, and, and that, nor should they. Uh, but when I became more interested in what technology could do versus how it did it, that, that became interesting to me in terms of how do product move? How do dollars move? How do, how do companies grow and flourish? How do you expand into different markets? And so that's when it became uh, apparent because, you know, in prior lives, when I was working at uh, MSA Management Science America, Dun & Bradstreet Software, when I took Optum Public and we were part of the Oracle CPG suite, et cetera, we're dealing with Fortune 1 on down in terms of companies and their operations. And, you know, it was... It was obvious, right? Look at the calendar. What's today? Monday. Not if you go to some of these companies. They go, it's the day after Sunday or it's the day before Tuesday. No, it's Monday. And, you know, that that twisting and turning of them not being able to, because we have to talk to this one, this one, this one, this one, all to come to the same conclusion, that it doesn't suit me. It the, My wiring doesn't allow for that. I'm not a rear view mirror person. You learn from history but I'm not going to go back and constantly look at things. You know, how do you move forward? How do you, how do you define the path? How do you remove the obstacles? How do you enable your company, your team to do what they need to do? And then how do they, how do you stay the hell out of the way? Okay. And so, you know, micromanagement and all those other things, nah, it just doesn't work for me. How do we keep the good money in and the bad money out of cannabis? Well, it, you know, it, uh, it starts with the states, believe it or not. And it starts with the cannabis operators and, and it starts with them by being together. Okay. So these operators, they have to work really, really hard to get a license. And I don't care what component of the market you're in. You, you have to work hard to get your license. So don't do something silly and compromise that. Don't, don't do things that you know you shouldn't be doing. And if you do that, it's going to manifest itself through your data. Okay. So, I mean, you know, the quick and easy example is you can't be a dispensary and you're doing, I'll make the math easy for me. You can't uh, say you're doing hundred thousand dollars worth of sales a week, but you only buy, you know, $10,000 worth of product every month. The markup's not that big, you know? So, okay. You're selling your own homegrown weed or your buddy's weed or some, you know, some third party product that's coming through the back door, but the money's going out the front door. And so financial institutions are leery about that because those are the stories that get reported, right? And so, you know, broad brush, painting the industry, 
prior prejudices, et cetera. So they need to know at a data level that these things are all in sync, that they're operating to the rules and regs. And then as you look at mixed use markets where it's gone from medical to adult use, you still can't sell a medical product to an adult patient. You know, how does that work? They just need to know that. And so looking at the data, looking at the sales, looking at the inventory, looking at the financial activity, triangulate that data, you can paint a very, very clear picture as to the health and well-being and compliance of any business and therefore their money. How would you compare coming from other markets? How would you compare the business savvy, business acumen of the average cannabis operator versus other markets that you've worked in? It's a great question, but uh, this isn't a comment directed at you. It's somewhat of an unfair comparison, right? And and the reason why I say that is uh, in, in my prior lives in all those roles, you're talking about global CPG brands, uh, et cetera. So, I mean, I, I had Starbucks as a client for two different technology companies. I ran order management and one for warehouse management. We had them as customers twice. And this is going back into... Uh, into the 80s and early 90s when they were fledgling, right, franchises, et cetera. So you look at what they did versus, you know, a parallel as to how dispensary operations are opening, or you look at global CPG brands that are using crops and, and grain at scale, like, you know, metric tons on a daily basis, or, um, you know, processed food places that, uh, you know, work with uh, 30,000 uh, livestock per day, et cetera. Different rules, different things had to be applied. But just because the scale was up here didn't mean the data happened, didn't happen down here. And so it's that level of thinking of what's that, what are the data elements that have to be applied? And then how do you better help these operators that may be less sophisticated and have less experience to show them what to do? Don't paint them a picture. You got to show them what they need to do. So compliance within the operation is how we push that back to the operators because we say, hey, your operation's running this well. Oh, but by the way, this particular bud tender, boy, do they make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> so, or they're doing stuff that you should be aware of. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good example. What are other ways that Green Check help unlock, quote unquote, actionable insights for operators? Well, it's part of it's part of the evolving industry. So again, I'll just go I'll go back to some of my background and and some of these things are are real head scratchers for me, David. So and you know, fill in the blanks here, if you will, as we go along. So if you go into you know a large scale commercial uh, grocery store, when you walk in the door, there's anywhere from forty thousand to sixty thousand unique SKUs in that store. Okay, big store. My wife always said, just shop on the outside, all the bad stuff's in the middle, et cetera. Obviously, I don't listen to her advice as well as I should, but 40 to 50,000 products. That's a lot, okay? Now, compare that to a dispensary or in even like we were just talking about we're in Vegas. Compare it to Planet 13, okay? The mega store, all right? In the past, in the past 18 months, when we're looking at the data that we've collected, we've identified 2.9 million unique SKUs, okay? 2.9 versus 50,000. That's a problem. That's a gigantic data problem. That's a gigantic purchasing problem, marketing problem, sales problem, consumer problem, you know, up against an industry that's growing and maturing, okay? There is no, no reason for 2.9 million unique SKUs whether it's by different brands, modalities, methods of delivery, you know, all of those things, okay? So, you know, if and then you look at the supply chain, okay, and this is critical, the supply chain of commerce over the supply chain of the plant, look at that, you know, compounding confusion that creates for everybody. What do I buy? What do I sell? What are people buying? What's working? What are, you know, how do I recommend a product? How do I grow a product? How do I present a product? How do I package it? And so data to action is, you know, a big part of what we're focusing on for the future for the cannabis operators. Two key data points there on top of 2.9 million. So 
recent studies and whether the number is 100% factual or not, 65% of cannabis businesses are not profitable. Okay. That was an MJ Biz uh, uh, article recently, et cetera. And again, let's just say that that's the number. We also know, or in also other studies are saying 20% of uh, retail operators are over inventoried of product. Okay. Now, if we can help cannabis operators take that inventory level based upon sell through market analysis, what people are buying, what you should be inventorying. Okay. And if we can drop that down to 10% over inventory, let's say 5%, because that's tolerable in a retail environment, and you can take that much money off of their expense margin, what happens to those 65%? All of a sudden, that's going to drop to under 50% because the margin difference between over inventory and over profitability and positive cash flow all cascades. Okay. But how does an operator know? Right? How, how does one of these single store operators or multi unit operators or even the MSOs, candidly, how do they know what they should be buying, how much they should be buying, what's their sell through? So back to the sophistication. Sorry, it's a long answer, but you get me going. I'm at, you, know, you, you, you wind me up on data and I'm off. Okay. So back to that sophistication. If you go into a retail operator and you say, tell me what your open order is, and they'll say, what does that mean? Okay. They should know that. A lot of them will say, well, I have $10,000 in the bank. So my open order is 10,000. It's not the right answer. What's your demand planning? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not certain. And so how do we, how does everybody that's involved in this industry, how do you enable that and move that forward more? And so that's a big push that we have for 2024 by taking the fact that we know there's 2.9 million SKUs and say, mm, you know what? You don't need that many. This is where you have to go. So how, in your opinion, how do you move that forward? How do we... Uh, start moving forward with skew consolidation and, you know, giving people more information on what's working and what's not working. You have to take more of a macro view and then a micro view of what's going on in the market. Right. So again, every state and every, every license is different. You know, our, you know, what can they sell? What should be, what should they be selling? And it's not to create a, a rigid program where they're not looking at new products and expanding to the contrary, right? It's this so that they're not buying a lot of things that aren't moving or are going to sit on their shelves for a period of time. And so, you know, consumer demand and consumer behavior uh, is fairly predictable, right? What are the things that move? What are the things that don't? And at the same time, okay, you have a lot of super creative, very bright new products entering the space. Uh, but then you also have folks that are saying, you know, pre-buy, buy ahead, inventory ahead. We're going to give you better payment terms. I don't want better payment terms for something I'm never going to sell. However, people are like, ooh, that seems like a good deal. And that might be the right thing to do versus is it the right thing to do? And that's where the data and the action of data is going to come into play versus the marketing and the visibility of it the, or the presentation of it rather. How do you create these unique tailored experiences for each client? And I mean, I guess for me, I thought that perhaps these experiences would be different, but it sounds like what you're saying is that, you know, it's kind of the same across the board. Is it not different like from like a mature market versus a very uh, nascent market? See, and it's not different. That that That's the beauty of it, right? I mean, again, consumer behavior is is predictable. Consumer consumption in the cannabis industry is fairly predictable. You know, if you go back, and again, this is part of the part of the the thesis for how Green Check was formed and defined. You know, it was in this number of states, it was going to go here. It was this volume of dollars, it was projected to go here. Those things have happened. Okay, the only reason why they've happened and they've happened fairly closely is because consumer adoption, consumer behavior enabled those predictions to actually come true. And so what are people buying? Where are they buying it? What's that method of which they're buying? What's their preferred 
product set, et cetera. And then, you know, the brands and everything else will, will survive and thrive and grow accordingly. So, you know, you, you, again, I'll go back to the grocery store. Walk down the aisle of a grocery store and where it says cereal, okay? It's a whole aisle from one end cap to the other, and it's got specialties on both end caps, okay? You have brand loyalty. You walk right past a bunch of the other stuff. You have brand uh, brand space. Eye height for kids is sweet and crap. Eye height for adults is supposed to be the healthy stuff. And then the big box stuff is on top where, you know, little old ladies can't reach it because they're not going to buy for families and et cetera. So the cannabis industry should be the same way. It should be evolving to that. You want that curated bud tender experience. But, you know, as you walk through and get get in there, you want to know, hey, what's new? OK, end caps. What's exciting? Let me tell you. OK, what are my utility products? OK, these are the things that I get all the time. And how do I just get them and, you know, be able to get out of the store? Because a lot of people want that quick consumer experience. And how do you make it easy? And how do you present that to them? OK, where it doesn't just happen once they go through the doors. How does it happen outside the store? And then that becomes customer loyalty. That becomes brand loyalty. That becomes location loyalty. Is the industry evolving towards that or are there like what are some of the myths or misnomers that are kind of tripping operators up i think you know i think the biggest one is still that that visibility of the greater market versus their their segment okay their their door okay and again a lot of this information uh, is available in, through a lot of varieties of different means, but it's about context. And so that's, that's I think that's the key thing that, that's missing. So, you know, a parallel that I'll talk about. And we learned this lesson here at, at, uh, at Green Check. So, you know, very quickly, I used to say, you know, how can you bank cannabis why would you bank cannabis and can you bank cannabis? Okay. I had it all wrong, David. I had it backwards. Okay. Cause you got to give somebody the reason why you have to let them know they can, and then you show them how, once they know why everybody wants to figure out how. So the context is, and this is the same for how we approach FIs versus how operators have to approach their customers. Okay. We can all say the cannabis industry is, you know, $50 billion, $30 billion, $40 billion, insert number here for 2024. You know what that means to a banker in Toledo, Ohio? I don't know. They don't know. Cause, okay. You can then go and say, cause Ohio, I'm using Ohio cause they just passed, right? You can go to, you know, the same banker in Toledo, Ohio and say, it's going to be a uh, $5 billion industry in Ohio in the next year. Again, there's no context for that individual. If you went to him and said, your opportunity in, in your area of service, either as a credit union or a bank, is going to be $500 million in the next two years. That's context. They can work with that. They can wrap their head around that. They could go, okay, I can see how I can impact that based upon the products and services I want to provide. You have to apply the same parallel thinking if you're an operator, okay? What's your What's your market? What's that target market like Oklahoma? How many licenses are there, you know, per person? Okay. Guess what's not going to work? That. Okay. So uh, what's your what's your market? What's your available sale to? And what are people buying? And how do you get the right product at the right price for the sell through? And that's the way that the operators have to look at it versus I got a license, I'm opening the door, I can sell weed. You have several case studies on your website, and they're all very informative. I, um, I'm a sucker for a case study just because it kind of really breaks down how it works for each individual business. But do you have one that stands out um, as a premier example of green check being used by a client? Well, so, you know, because we, we serve multiple audiences all through the same platform. So I would say... You know, on the on the FI side, uh, I hate to single anyone out because we love all our all our customers and partners. But I would say if you look at what Canna First is doing, so Canna First is a division of Merchant and Marine Bank, and 
Um, they recently just put out a video that's on their website. And so they uh, they are uh, located, you know, they operate in Alabama and Mississippi, okay? And so um, they entered the space. They set up a whole division, and it's called Canna First Financial, and it's, and it's working there. And as Jeff Trammell, who's in charge of that program, and he's the CEO of the bank, in the video, he says, you know, we don't go, we serve cannabis. He goes, we serve cannabis. And so, I mean, I think back to how we started and to where we are. I think that's that's an exceptional uh, definition of success and impact and change that we've been able to enable because, you know, in that same video, obviously, the, on, we didn't solicit this. They gave an endorsement. We do that because we utilize Green Check. We know what we're doing. We know how we're serving this industry. And so that allows bankers to be bankers and serve the cannabis industry. Now you go on to the flip side and you look at somebody like Jungle Boys in California that, that we work with closely uh, in handling banking. And then through our Marketplace Connect, we introduced them to Greenleaf uh, from, from an HR perspective. They took over all their uh, payroll and because they're using the same data and they're enabling it. And now guess what? Jungle Boys get to be cannabis operators. They don't have to worry about being banking compliance people. They don't have to worry about payroll. They don't have to worry about getting thrown out of a bank relationship. They're building their business because data has connected them to the providers and the providers are happy servicing them all at reasonable price points. How will rescheduling cannabis, if and when it happens, how will that affect current cannabis banking as we know it? So whether it's descheduling or safer, you can't we can't really separate them, and you know we we can keep the talk track separate. But um, descheduling is uh, not going to make it easier. You know that that's a myth. Be careful what you wish for, everybody. Okay, because you don't know what they're going to deschedule it to. Right? To, you know, as in T U O, not schedule two. Um, one, I think the one thing we can count on, David, across the board, and I believe this wholeheartedly, and I love being wrong, but you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna hang my hat on this one, is we can count on Washington to make things have more rules and regulations, not less. Okay. Now, what is going to happen with descheduling and or rescheduling is that a lot of the other current uh, financial institution programs that are out there that are manual they're going to blow up the day that that becomes law. Not when it's passed, but when it becomes law. Because what it's going to do is it's going to require more tracking and tracing of the source of the product, where the product moved, how the product moved, and how it was paid for. Again, in that whole supply chain of commerce over the supply chain of the plant. And so there'll be more rules and regulations, not less. And that will become problematic. So you'll see a lot of <clears throat> manual programs that are out there today that are suffering because they can't scale and they can't do it at the right effective price points. They will contract and or just shut down. When you talk about the warnings as to what it'll be scheduled to or rescheduled to, what are you talking about? Well, there's schedule two, schedule three. Some people. Oh, think yeah, no, not. Yeah. You yeah. had mentioned two. Oh, yeah. Or T.O. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I meant. Is it going to be go to schedule two? Is it going to go to schedule three? Is it going to go, going to be completely rescheduled? Because oh, then, you know, here, here's the challenge. They can reschedule it, but, you know, in a parallel universe, there's nothing like this that's ever happened, in, at least in my lifetime, because we're not old enough for prohibition. But there's nothing like that has impacted more agencies within Washington, okay? So just because they reschedule it, Department of Justice and Treasury are not going to say, oh, well, then go ahead and bank it, okay? Because the illicit market and the expanded illicit market um, with other products and services, the psychedelics, et cetera, you know, now all of a sudden can enter the same market and they, they want to make sure that money is not moving inappropriately. And so there's going to be more rules and regulations. It's, just, it's going to be, it can end up becoming more like pharma, right? What's in front of the counter? What's behind the counter? You have that situation today, but with that rescheduling, what's behind the counter is going to have even more rules and regulations. That's 
I guess that's what I thought you were getting at in terms of like, be careful what you wish for when it comes to regulation. Exactly. Yeah. Well, because people hang, you know, it's the, it's the simple thing, right? They hang their hand on a word. Mm-hmm. Okay. Understand what the word means. Yeah. Is there still a lot of predatory money out in the industry today? Less, thank God. Much less. And even uh, even the players that participate in that predatory space, um, they've had to they've had to adjust their business practices. Now, unfortunately, as we've seen the Fed rate increases, et cetera, um, depending on their cost of capital, those higher those higher loan rates are still there. But you know the early days of warrants and equity positions and um, you know, putting money out at rate where the debt service means that those businesses, you know, were never going to be able to service that debt. And they, they're, you know, they paid somebody to take their license in some instances. And we've seen that happen. Um, that's very unfortunate. I think operators have got more sophisticated. I think the industry is communicating better. So they're like, uh, 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 stay away. Don't do that. And then I think we're seeing better rate pressure. So we know 50% of the financial institutions that uh, are serving the cannabis industry through green check are actively lending into the cannabis industry. That, that number is better than what I had thought would have happened in 2023. So Ohio just legalized. What happens now from a banking services perspective? More of them are raising their hand because they're, they're interested in, in the industry. They realize that you know, if they do it the right way, that these are viable businesses and could be great customers for the financial institution. And in today's economic set, there isn't a financial institution that isn't looking for enhanced deposit dollars. This is uh, this is a, a easy path to establish uh, a stronger deposit base, you know, with those businesses. Now, Ohio, as is the case with every other new state, Retained deposits early on are going to be a challenge. The money's going in, money's coming out. They're they're building, they're operating, uh, but they're interested and they raise their hands. So we see that. So do the credit unions come to you, or do you go to um, credit unions and other banks and kind of pitch your services? So we have a sales force, we have a sales team, we have a marketing department, and uh, we pitch to uh, all the financial institutions across the U.S. So there's 9,000 plus of them. And some of them have told us no thanks. And we know to not to go to the big ones because it's not a it's not a needle mover for them. So, you know, go stay over there. Um but we do market to them. But one of the things that we do that uh, has been exceptionally helpful is every month we do uh, our cannabis banking boot camp, and we have cannabis banking accreditation program. And so, uh, financial institutions can sign up and learn what is cannabis banking mean. What is it as a line of business? What are the things you have to think of? You know, how are your policies, procedures, risk assessment, liquidity strategies, exit, all that work. How do you work with your corresponding bank and your insurance providers? And how do you get your board comfortable in the C-suite and business development, compliance and risk and legal? How does that all work? What does that look like? And, you know, back to why would you do it? Okay. This is how you can do it. Okay. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. But why would you do that? What's that financial model? What's that context? How do you in Toledo, Ohio know, hey, I should serve this industry? Okay. From your perspective, how would you describe the state of cannabis banking? Vastly improved from where it was, but nowhere near where it needs to be. So that that may sound contradictory. So, you know, I can remember, you know, back to the early days and it wasn't that long ago. And I'll go back, gosh, even just four years ago, we used to get, uh, uh, I, we call it the Heisman, okay? You know, like football. You know, you couldn't say cannabis. Eh, you know, we would get the Heisman. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. that stop, stop, stop. Don't, 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 don't. We're done, okay? So cannabis banking to where we are now. Last month we had uh, over two hundred and eighty people sign up for our boot camp out of in in over one hundred and ninety different financial institutions. 
So they're looking, they're exploring, they're trying to figure out how to serve it. So that that's positive. We've also seen in some states where fees have gone to zero. There are no fees for cannabis banking, which is magnificent, okay? Because it eventually will get that way nationwide, as it should be, okay? So we've had a direct impact in, in allowing that progression to occur because, again, technology does what people can't at scale and at a sufficient price point. But 50% of our active FIs are lending. That should be 100%. Okay, because there isn't an FI that doesn't have a business relationship with a business that will not lend to them in some form or fashion. Could be merchant cash advance, could be a small loan for inventory, could be for expansion, et cetera. Banks and credit unions make money by lending money. They don't make money by just taking your deposit. And so a lot of times we'll talk to an FI and we'll say, um, you know, they want to charge, again, I'll make the money, the math easy for me. They want to charge $1,000 a month. I'll say, I will pay you $1,000 a month. I'll personally pay you $1,000 a month to bank David's business. Because when you're banking David's business, I'm going to lend David a million dollars. And I'm going to charge David 8%. So I'm going to make $80,000. Guess what? I made $68,000 because I gave you $12,000. And they're like, wait a minute, I want to make $80,000. Well, that's the V8 moment. Well, then don't charge them $1,000 a month. Be a bank, be a business partner. And then they go, oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Tell me more. So at these boot camps, have you figured out the blueprints as to how it works? Or are you still evolving and adapting to serve a greater base? No, we, we have the blueprint, okay? But that's not to say we don't revisit it all the time. So Ohio is a great example, okay? The rules change the minute it goes mixed use because you have to be able to adapt the rules. And so the adoption actually comes more in terms of the, the customers you're gonna, you're gonna provide as well as the products and services that you're gonna provide because if you're gonna just have a depository relationship and you wanna offer payroll services to their employees, that's that's one segment of how you can do it. It's all the same software, same product, everybody pays the same price, but if you wanna offer lending, okay, now how does lending work? And then what this also, you also always have to make sure you do, and this is part of the definition, how does it fit in with any other high risk uh, clients or products and services that you may have already in your portfolio. And so if you're in an area where gaming is prevalent, if you're in an area where you have, for whatever reason, a lot of pawn shops, or you're working with money services businesses, you can't, from a safety and soundness perspective, you can't take your financial institution and put it into a very uncomfortable positioning in terms of how the regulators are gonna view your mix of clients and dollars. And then all of a sudden you have to exit one program. And so we never want to be in a position where cannabis is the one that gets thrown out the door because it might be the easiest and most expedient. So those are the conversations that we have. So the framework is pretty baked in, in the same, but there's no two financial institutions that are the same. There's no two cannabis markets that are identical. So the variance comes in how you're going to serve what products and services, and then the connections are the data. That's the easy part. Well, Kevin, I really appreciate you being really generous with your time. Before we get out of here, is there anything else that you want to make sure the Cannabis Equipment News audience either knows about yourself or Green Check? Um, I think our reputation speaks for itself. I mean, we're the, we're the clear leader out there in terms of the number of FIs. We have over 7,700 cannabis businesses on the platform. And through Connect, which is the, the marketplace, we have 40 strategic partners. These are curated, vetted people that are, are well-intentioned, that are serving the industry, and are going to do it in a non-abusive, serious fashion. And so, you know, we're going to stick to what our core principles are of connecting these industries together and doing a scale and a price point that is going to allow everybody to be successful. Well, Kevin, thank you very much for taking the time, man. I really do appreciate it. 
this the whole financial side of the industry, like any more insight I can get into it, it just really helps me kind of get a better understanding of what's going on. David, anytime you want to talk to me on or off the record, reach out. It, this is important. That's why we do the boot camps. Education first, the rest follows. Excellent. Well, I'm certainly going to take you up on that. Um, but before we get out of here, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. If you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You can also subscribe to our daily newsletter. Make sure you get it delivered to your inbox first. For Kevin Hart, founder and CEO of Green Check, I'm David Manti. This is the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast, and we'll see you next week.